Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Hot Topics in Environmental Law Summer Lecture Series. I'm Jenny Rushlow, Interim Graduate School Dean and Associate Dean for Environmental Programs here at Vermont Law and Graduate School. We're very pleased to welcome you to our presentation today. Each of these talks is worth one CLE credit in Vermont. And so if you'd like to claim that credit, you simply need to take um, keep track of the talks you attend for your records. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation today. And if you're watching on the VLGS YouTube page or on Facebook, you can just enter your questions into the chat or comments space at any time um, during the talk, it doesn't matter. And I'll collect those and get through as many as we can during the Q&A. Today, we're really pleased to welcome Robert Percival, Professor Percival is the director of the Environmental Law Program and Robert F. Stanton Professor of Law at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. He served as a law clerk for Judge Shirley Hubstetler of the Ninth Circuit and for Supreme Court Justice Byron White and spent six years as an attorney for the Environmental Defense Fund. He has served as a visiting professor at Harvard Law School and Georgetown Law School. He's the principal author of the most widely used environmental law casebook in academia. He was a Fulbright scholar at the China University of Political Science and Law in Beijing and has worked with China's Supreme People's Court, the National People's Congress, the Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection and more. And he's presented lectures at more than 30 Chinese universities. And in 2009, he represented the United States State Department on a lecture tour of China. He uh, is joining VLGS this summer, teaching environmental governance in the developing world, as he has for a number of years. And today, his talk is titled, What Environmental Lawyers Should Know About the Supreme Court's Shadow Docket. It is truly a privilege to be able to hear from such a scholar of the US Supreme Court on this topic right now. Please join me in welcoming Professor Percival. Thank you, Jenny. It's really a, a pleasure to be in Vermont, particularly this time of year. It's sort of ironic that I'm actually here in Vermont, but we're doing this talk over Zoom. But actually, that's probably better because I've been told by my dean that I'm the one Maryland faculty member who consistently gets higher ratings when I teach virtually <laughs> instead of in person. No one knows why that is. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and this uh, photo was actually done by the folks at the Environmental Law Institute for the Environmental Forum. I wrote this article in the January, February issue of the Environmental Forum about the Supreme Court shadow docket. Uh, it's become much more important in recent years than it ever was before. And uh, the first question to answer is what is the Supreme Court shadow docket? And it actually refers to emergency applications to the court uh, to act very quickly, usually on stays to grant or deny a stay. The term was actually uh, coined by Professor William Baud of the University of Chicago Law School in an article that he'd originally entitled, uh, Paying Attention to the Orders List, because all that comes out from the Supreme Court is an order. And when he sent the draft article around, people said, that's a really boring title. Uh, why don't you call it the Supreme Court secret docket? And he said, well, it's not really secret. So I'll call it the shadow docket. And that's how it got its name. Bought head clerk for Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, and it made a huge impact on environmental law. And many people trace the increasing use of the shadow docket to what the Supreme Court did to the Clean Power Plan. When after years of work, EPA had developed a comprehensive plan to regulate emissions of greenhouse gases from existing power plants, there was lots of legal challenges to it. And they were assigned to a three judge panel of the DC circuit. That panel said, there's no reason to stay the plan while we hear the, the legal challenges to it because it's not gonna come into effect for more than a decade before it's fully effective and it won't have that much of an immediate impact. They agreed to expedite the case and they denied the stay. But then the Supreme Court did something totally unprecedented. Uh, at the behest 
of the state petitioners by a five to four vote, they intervened and stayed the effectiveness of the clean power plan before the DC circuit had even a chance to hear the legal challenges to it. This has been called a, a lightning bolt. Uh, and it was particularly perplexing because this was the order. There was no explanation of why. And in retrospect, it's clear that the, case, the court got completely bamboozled by the petitioners who said horrible things will happen, will suffer irreparable harm, because as a result of this order, the Clean Power Plan has never gone into effect. And yet the electric utilities subject to it have reduced their greenhouse gas emissions by the same amount that would have been required under the plan as a result largely of market forces. This was at a time when the court was split right down the middle with Justice Kennedy, who provided the fifth and decisive vote in Massachusetts versus EPA to let the EPA regulate emissions of greenhouse gases under the Clean uh, Air Act. And Kennedy perplexingly went the other way in this and agreed to put this on hold until all legal challenges to it were resolved. Now, of course, as uh, this uh, was trumpeted by opponents of environmental regulation as the end of the clean power plan, the death of the complete complete power plan here, this article says it's dead and will not be resurrected. And yet four days later, uh, four days after that vote, something shocking happened, Justice Scalia died. And many people thought, well, now the balance of the court will tip in favor of a sympathetic approach to environmental law as a new justice will be appointed. Ironically, Chief Justice Roberts, just five days before the unprecedented action by the court to stay the clean power plan, had decried the notion that the justices were political uh, and suggested that the confirmation process should be apolitical. And yet we all know what happened. Uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, refused to allow even a hearing on Barack Obama's appointment of Merrick Garland, nomination of him to the Supreme Court. Now, uh, I also fault uh, friends in the Democratic Party for not pushing harder for Garland's confirmation. I think the problem was everyone assumed Hillary Clinton was going to get elected. In fact, the Republicans were saying, well, she is elected. Maybe we'll just leave that seat vacant if we still control the Senate. Subsequently, what finally happened to the Clean Power Plan, we all know on June 30th, the Supreme Court, even though the Biden administration said we have no need to revive it again, reached out and issued this uh, precedent setting decision saying that this new major questions doctrine that came out of nowhere means that despite clear language in the Clean Air Act requiring regulation of existing sources, EPA has no authority to do what it wanted to do uh, in the Clean Power Plan. Uh, in order, the major questions doctrine had been raised by the dissenter below, Judge Justin Walker, who had been quickly confirmed to the DC Circuit as its youngest judge. He comes from a family that were personal friends of Senator Mitch McConnell, and it was arranged for a conservative judge to retire uh, quickly so that they could have that vacancy. Now, we also saw the Supreme Court use the shadow docket in the Juliana case. That is the reason that the plaintiff's hope for trial in this case never took place. Originally, uh, the effort to stop that proceeding was brought to the Supreme Court in 2018. This was the litigation against the federal government for not protecting current and future generations from the impact of climate change. And in the very last vote that Justice Kennedy cast as a member of the Supreme Court, before he stepped down creating the vacancy that Justice Kavanaugh assumed, he cautioned the Ninth Circuit that they should, and the district court hearing this case, that they should 
uh, worked to try to narrow the very broad claims that the plaintiffs were making. Then on the eve of trial, uh, the uh, several months later, Chief Justice Roberts stepped in and ordered that the discovery and trial be halted just days before the trial was likely to start. Some of the witnesses were already about to board planes from Portland for this trial of the century on climate change. Ultimately, the Supreme Court issued an order that did not block the trial itself, but it sternly lectured the Ninth Circuit that uh, it's time for them to get involved in intervening in this case. Uh, interestingly, uh, two justices, Justices Thomas and Gorsuch, would have just wiped out and, and dismissed that litigation without any hearing being held at all. Ultimately, uh, federal district judge Ann Aiken was bludgeoned into certifying an interlocutory appeal to the Ninth Circuit, which she had been reluctant to do, saying, let's hear the claims of these plaintiffs, let's hear all the evidence. And the Ninth Circuit, as we know, uh, dismissed the case on the grounds of lack of standing, not because climate change was not real and having a damaging impact right now, but because of questions about the ability of courts to redress the uh, harm that was occurring. That was a two to one decision with a very strong dissent. And so far the plaintiffs have no interest in taking that to the Supreme Court because they know what the current court would do with that and create a worse precedent. Now, uh, in the research I did years ago in the Supreme Court papers, I found that there are other instances of the shadow docket being used in environmental cases. There was a huge battle over a stay from the Supreme Court in the reserve mining case. In this case, uh, taconite tailings were being dumped in large quantities in Lake Superior, and it was thought that that might cause asbestos type diseases with a long latency period. So District Judge Miles Lord had ordered that the plant immediately cease the discharges, which the plant said it would have to close if it did. The Eighth Circuit then granted a stay. And in order to ensure that the Eighth Circuit decided the case quickly, uh, after negotiations failed with the company, several states asked the Supreme Court to vacate the stay. Initially, Ju Justice Douglas uh, was the only vote to vacate the stay. But the court itself was very concerned and they monitored very carefully what had happened, what was happening in the case in the Eighth Circuit. In fact, there was a back channel between Justice Blackman and Judge Bright on the Eighth Circuit to find out what was going on. And the Supreme Court essentially told the Eighth Circuit informally that if you didn't finalize your opinion fairly quickly, uh, we might end up dissolving the stay. Ultimately, the court came out with its decision, which kind of uh, split the baby in half, saying that the plant should close, but giving it more time, should find a different method of disposal, but giving it more time to do so. Now, during the Trump administration, there's been an there was an unprecedented use of stay applications by the Solicitor General on behalf of President Trump and uh, federal agencies. This caused Justice Sotomayor in a dissent from a case where one of those stays was granted five to four to explain what was wrong with the shadow docket. Uh, she said it should be re reserved for truly extraordinary cases, but now it's become almost routine. And more troubling to her was that the court's recent behavior on stay applications has benefited one litigant over all others, the Trump administration. She said that eroded the fair and balanced decision-making process that the court must strive to protect. Uh, she noted that uh, this forces the court to consider important questions that have not been fully ventilated in the lower courts on abbreviated timetables and without oral argument. 
upending the normal appellate process and putting a thumb on the scale in favor of the party that won the state. Now, statistically, she's absolutely right. If you look at the 16 years of both the George W. Bush and Barack Obama administration, only eight times did the Solicitor General representing the federal government ask the Supreme Court to grant a stay. That's um, you know, only one time every two years. But during the four years of the Trump administration, the Solicitor General 41 times went to the Supreme Court asking for a stay more than 10 times a year. And in the vast majority of the cases, the conservative justices agreed to the Trump administration's request for a stay. And in fact, um, during the pandemic, um, seven times the Supreme Court intervened to block state regulations on the grounds that they interfered with religious liberty. Uh, during the 15 years that Chief Justice Roberts had been on the Supreme Court, only four times had the court blocked state regulations from going into effect. But with the new conservative supermajority as a result of Amy Coney Barrett being quickly rushed onto the court, even as voting had started in the 2020 presidential election, the court intervened seven times to do so. Now, in September of last year, Justice Barrett uh, gave a speech where she said, my purpose in this speech is to convince you that the court is not comprised of a bunch of partisan hacks. It was kind of a strange venue she selected for giving this speech because she was introduced by Mitch McConnell, who had been responsible for blocking Garland's confirmation at the University of Louisville's McConnell Center. Uh, it could not have been a more partisan setting. The major point she made was we just have different judicial philosophies. We don't favor one political party over another. And she argued that the way you could tell that we're not being political is to read our decisions. Now, critics of the shadow docket said, wait a minute, um, there are no decisions when you issue an order. It just says, the clean power plan is stayed or uh, the state regulations to prevent the spread of COVID-19 are stayed because we have potential constitutional concerns. It provides no guidance whatsoever. Justice Alito, uh, after the Supreme Court last September 1st, refused the request to stay the new Texas abortion law gave a speech at Justice Barrett's former law school, University of Notre Dame, decrying critics of the shadow docket. He said that it's really an attempt to intimidate the court or damage it as an independent institution by portraying the justices as doing something shadowy. Uh, and of course, that's not the genesis of the term shadow docket. It wasn't something liberals invented to make the court look bad. It was from that law review article by Chief Justice Roberts, former clerk. Alito went on to say that it was inflammatory to contend that by allowing the Texas law to go into effect, the court had nullified Roe v. Wade. He says, we did no such thing. Uh, and in fact, in light of his subsequent opinion and decision in the Dobbs case, expressly reversing Roe v. Wade as a decision that had been wrongly decided from the start, uh, his speech last September uh, looks like it uh, is anything but accurate in trying to defend the shadow docket. He points out, well, uh, we've always had to hear emergency appeals, but way back when, when I was clerking on the court 
in the late 1970s, the only time we really had emergency applications were in death penalty cases. Those cases, the courts always got last minute appeals to try to decide whether or not to allow an execution to go ahead, the epitome of irreparable harm if the petitioner is, is executed. And if you look at history, uh, the court has been able to decide really important cases through the normal process of briefing an oral argument in a very quick fashion when it's necessary to have an expeditious decision. As I point out in that article in the Environmental Forum in 1952, when President Truman tried to seize the steel mills during the Korean War, the court was able to decide that case in one month after full briefing and oral argument. The Pentagon Papers case, uh, the court took the case for argument and heard argument 12 days later and came out with this decision five days after oral argument. In the Nixon Tapes case, there were only 13 days allotted for briefing before the oral argument, and it was decided 16 days after the oral argument. Now, it's possible that these criticisms of the shadow docket are having some impact. In fact, uh, last October, uh, both justices Barrett and Kavanaugh in justifying their votes not to stay a Maine vaccine order uh, that the state of Maine had adopted uh, that some people were objecting to on religious grounds on the notion that we shouldn't be using the shadow docket to effectively decide uh, what the limits of the regulatory authority are when faced with religious objections, although the court had been doing that quite a bit prior to that. And then when the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's vaccine mandate was sought to be stayed before the court, it agreed to hear expedited oral argument. And in the decision that the court reached, it blocked the nationwide vaccine mandate for large businesses, but two justices who were in that six justice majority to block that mandate then switched sides and allowed the mandate for healthcare workers to take effect. Those two justices were Justices Kavanaugh and Chief Justice Roberts. And if you look at the court last term, you see that the two justices who agreed the most were Justices Kavanaugh and Chief Justice Roberts. They were in 100% agreement in the cases that were fully briefed and argued and decided on the merits. And when it comes to who was in the majority, in 95% of the cases, both Roberts and Kavanaugh won the prize as having been in the majority most frequently during the Supreme Court's term from 2021 to 2022, the term that just ended with the uh, West Virginia versus EPA decision. Now, you may recall that a couple of years ago, when there was an effort to gut the Clean Water Act by holding that any pollution that had first touched groundwater could not be subject to a permit requirement, the Supreme Court, when Justice Ginsburg was still alive and there were four liberals on the court, voted six to three to reject that effort to gut the Clean Water Act, and that was because Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh adopted a moderate position and the Chief Justice assigned the opinion to Justice Breyer in that case, the County of Maui versus Hawaii Wildlife Fund case. So there have been some hope that in environmental cases, you might see the moderating influence of those two justices uh, create some hope for good environmental decisions. I suggest that that's been kind of blown out of the water though by the court's decision in West Virginia versus EPA where both of those justices uh, were part of the six to three majority opinion refusing to allow EPA 
to regulate existing sources of greenhouse gases under Section 111D of the Clean Air Act by embracing this major questions doctrine. Now, it's true that Justice Kavanaugh uh, wrote a concurring opinion uh, suggest, or did, that the opinion for the majority that uh, uh, had been authored by Chief Justice Roberts did not go nearly as far as the concurring opinion by Justices Gorsuch and Alito. It will be interesting to see this fall when the Supreme Court hears the Sackett case, uh, whether or not they will again try to be moderates with respect to the Clean Water Act. Uh, that will be very important to see if the court will be continuing its slash and burn expedition through environmental law, having done that to the Clean Air Act this term, will they do that to the Clean Air Act next term? But I think the Dobbs decision and the explicit reversal of Roe v. Wade demonstrates that there are five committed conservatives that are willing to rock the boat and reconsider long established precedents. Roe v. Wade was in existence for more than 49 years. None of the justices that Trump nominated would have gotten on the court, would have been confirmed if they had been candid about their views concerning Roe v. Wade. Uh, even Alito at his confirmation hearings in 2005 uh, had to dissemble when it came to Roe v. Wade, which is kind of inconsistent with him saying in the Dobbs decision that it was egregiously wrong from the start. Uh, so we now live in a time where, as President Biden said, we have a radical conservative majority on the court that is willing to overturn precedents. And I'm sure that upsets Chief Justice Roberts, who has tried mightily over the years to at least preserve the appearance of the court as being a non-political institution that was just deciding the cases based on the law. That's the most recent picture of the Supreme Court because they don't have, they've not all gotten together yet for the October term 2022, where they will be joined by the newest justice, Ketanji Brown Jackson, who was confirmed uh, on a depressingly narrow confirmation vote, 53, uh, 53 to 47, one would think that in light of the fact that there was no supposed scandal in her background, like charges of sexual assault or sexual harassment has happened with uh, Kavanaugh and Thomas, that the vote wouldn't be that close. But now confirmations have become totally political. And it may well have been that had Hillary Clinton become president they, and the Republicans continued to control uh, the Senate that they would not have filled that vacancy. Um, now notice here, uh, this chart shows the current composition of the Supreme Court and who nominated uh, the justices we see only three justices, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson, who are nominated by Democratic presidents, even though the Democrats have won five out of the last seven elections overwhelmingly in the popular vote. We have now this conservative majority on the Supreme Court that uh, could be reconsidering lots of areas of law and that is not sympathetic to environmental law. Now, the most recent shadow docket order that the Supreme Court issued uh, was just last week. And one of the interesting things about this court that was always ruling in favor of the government during the Trump administration is that when the Biden administration has asked for emergency relief, uh, they haven't got it nearly as frequently. During the Trump administration, something like more than 250 federal judges were added to the federal courts with lifetime appointments. And I've looked carefully at the record of some of those judges, and I have this sort of rough rule of thumb that if they were confirmed on a straight party line vote, they are 
much more likely to be the political hacks that Justice Barrett was saying they shouldn't be. But if they were confirmed by a fairly substantial um, bipartisan majority, and about half of them were, uh, then you see judges appointed by, nominated by President Trump who are making very even-handed decisions. But because you also have this new crew of very conservative judges uh, loyal to partisan interests, you're gonna see a lot of decisions that the Biden administration is gonna to wanna to have put on hold, such as this decision. What was interesting though about this vote, it was five to four. And this time it wasn't Chief Justice Roberts joining the liberals. It was the first vote that Katanji Brown Jackson took as a Supreme Court justice. And she was joined by Justice Barrett. It was the first time there was a five to four with all four dissenters being women. I've watched kind of carefully, and I think it's fair to say that Justice Kagan is going out of her way to establish a good relationship with Justice Barrett. And uh, Justice Kagan, for example, split with the other two liberals and joined Justice Barrett's, the first majority opinion that she had been assigned. I don't know if there's anything to this, but it may be that that will become um, an important alliance to watch. So in conclusion, it's true, as Justice Alito said, the shadow dockets always existed, but it was usually just used in death penalty cases. Now, because it's been clear that the court is receptive to applications from conservative interests, it's being used far more frequently now, and almost all the court's rulings have favored conservative causes. It's something that I don't think is a good legal development because without a written explanation, these decisions should not have little precedential, should have little precedential value because they simply say, should we restore the status quo or not? But now the court seems to be treating them as important precedents. And without providing much guidance concerning what reasoning led to that particular result. What you see now is something we have not seen, at least in my lifetime on the Supreme Court, and that is that the conservative supermajority does not wanna tolerate lower court decisions that look like they're going to break in a liberal way. And so given that the losing parties in those cases, if they're conservatives, know the Supreme Court's receptive to certain things like claims of religious liberty being infringed upon or claims that an agency is overstepping the authority given it by Congress, it's much more likely that the court's supermajority will intervene even before lower courts have been able to hear a case on the merits with full briefing and oral argument. Now, just finally, every 4th of July, I live on Capitol Hill. I've lived there since I was clerking. Uh, I live just a few blocks from the Supreme Court. And every 4th of July, we take our granddaughter to the Capitol grounds so that we can watch the fireworks on the National Mall. And I took this photo when I walked by the court with my granddaughter on the way to the Capitol grounds. And as you can see, the court has erected what it calls an unclimbable fence all the way around the perimeter of the Supreme Court grounds. It used to be we would go jogging. My wife loved the gardens the Supreme Court has because she's a master gardener as a retired lawyer. Uh, and it's completely close to the public. Now, originally they closed the court to the public due to the pandemic. Uh, they haven't made a definitive decision about whether the court will remain closed to the public in the fall during the oral arguments. I think it's pretty likely it will be. And the reason won't be fear of getting COVID. It will because, be because of fear of demonstrations. The court knows that it's out of step with public opinions, particularly in light of its decisions with respect to overturning Roe v. Wade, uh, expanding the Second Amendment dramatically to create a right to carry uh, firearms, and 
its West Virginia versus EPA decision with respect to climate change. Uh, I think that's a very depressing development and um, one that is not likely to be reversed anytime soon. So I'll stop sharing my screen here and we can uh, go to questions. Thank you, Bob. Okay, we do have some questions, so I'm gonna jump right to it. Um, there we go. Had just a moment ago. Sorry, give me a sec. Um, so the first question is, I'm not a lawyer. Can you explain the difference between vacating a stay and denying a stay? Well, vacating a stay means that if a lower court has blocked something, you're lifting that block on it. Um, denying a stay means someone's asking you affirmatively to stay something that hasn't been stayed and you're uh, uh, saying you don't agree to do so. Thank you. And, and this court of course has been doing both. both. Uh, particularly in death penalty cases, they've been uh, uh, lifting stays that the lower courts have imposed in order to allow executions to go forward. Okay, next question. Do you foresee the continued growth of the use of the shadow docket in the future? Well, that's the jury's still out on that because the court has gotten so much criticism. Uh, the court does follow the election returns. And I think the criticisms of the shadow docket have been so salient that that explains why they at least decided to have expedited briefing and oral argument with respect to the OSHA vaccine mandate. So I think when they can do it, you might see uh, more expedited briefing. Uh, for example, uh, I just mentioned that last case in involving the lower court order restricting Biden's immigration policies. While the court denied the Biden administration's request for a stay, it did say, we're gonna hear that case on the merits and, and it's gonna schedule it for oral argument in the fall. Um, you also saw this year in the voting rights conduct, context, some very disturbing behavior from the court, some Trump judges that um, were confirmed with fairly large bipartisan majorities were part of a three judge panel that said that Alabama's new redistricting because it was intended to eliminate the seat of a, uh, that a largely African American district had violated the Voting Rights Act and therefore they couldn't use it for the November elections. But the Supreme Court came in and stayed that and said essentially, well, it's too late. You have to go ahead with this, apparently uh, to the three judge panel, illegal and racially discriminatory new plan for conducting the November elections. They then schedule that for oral argument, but I think it's a foregone conclusion how those justices are gonna rule, having already blocked the new plan that uh, was to uh, cure that, or the order to create a new plan uh, from going into effect. Thank you. Would public demonstrations actually influence the Supreme Court in any way, given your theory of the fence around the building? Um, well, I think it, if you look at Alito's opinion in Dobbs, he says, you know, Roe v. Wade created all this public controversy. Now, I'm old enough to know that there was a tremendous controversy before Roe v. Wade was decided. And if anything, he's got it exactly backwards. Uh, he then seems to suggest this will allow the political process to take over and will not have these huge partisan battles. Uh, clearly wrong. If anything, it's inflamed our politics. And my one hope is that there will be a wave of opposition to it demonstrated by the results of the midterm elections uh, this fall and the dissatisfaction with having such a radical conservative majority that for the first time in history, 
was willing to roll back a constitutional right that had been in existence for decades. Now, when I clerked for Justice White, it was after Roe v. Wade had been decided. And it's important that Roe v. Wade was decided by justices who both had been appointed by Democrats and Republicans. There were two dissenters in Roe v. Wade, Justice Rehnquist, uh, who had been appointed by President uh, Nixon, and Justice White, who I clerked for. And White actually uh, said that one of the reasons he didn't favor the majority in Roe v. Wade was that he was particularly wary of recognizing new constitutional rights because once they're created, they should not be rolled back. And that's precisely what the court has just done in Dobbs. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, what do you think is the next major environmental decision that SCOTUS will weigh in on, um, on or off the shadow docket? Uh, wow, that's a good one. Uh, it, uh, if EPA, uh, well, I'm not sure what EPA, well, okay, let me just get really dark here. And that is what I've been telling people the court this fall is scheduled to hear these affirmative action cases involving Harvard, and I believe it's the University of North Carolina, uh, where it's expected that they'll reverse precedent that recognize diversity as a valid goal in education and say that you cannot consider race at all in university admissions. And I think the next thing that's gonna happen is that when EPA for the first time really seems to be taking seriously environmental justice issues, there could be a case where some industry group is denied a permit because it's gonna be contributing to disproportionate exposure of minority communities, will then go to the court and say, they're taking race into account and you've now just said they can't do that and it will be used as a cudgel to try to make it impossible to remedy environmental injustices. So um, I'm just putting that out there uh, to show the high stakes that are present in a lot of these cases. What, um, what do you think uh, are the merits or likelihood of adding more justices to the Supreme Court? Well, President Biden appointed a commission to look into that. Now, a lot of the members of the commission were academics, uh, and, but it, was, it had some really great people on it. And uh, they basically came to the conclusion that if the Democrats did this, then the Republicans would do the same thing. And you would have a totally politicized court that would be continually expanding in size. Now, I actually think that if it was ever justified to expand the court, it, it's justified now. Article three does not set the number of Supreme Court justices. It just says there'll be a Supreme Court and leaves it to Congress to fill in the details. At the time, we had nine justices back, over, back in the 1860s, the last iteration, uh, was justified in part because there were nine circuits for the justices so they could each have one circuit to be the circuit judge to look after initially the stay applications. Now, it just so happens we have 13 with the federal circuit, 11 circuits and the DC circuit. You could justify having 13 justices on that grounds. Now, you know, one in light of how radical the Republicans in the Senate have been on these issues, uh, I'm sure that the fear is valid that if uh, the Democrats expanded the Supreme Court, that they would do the same. And I think it's also true about the filibuster. I think in the filibuster context, they've already, the Republicans eliminated the filibuster in order to get the Trump justices confirmed. The deal had been cut that we were no longer be, going to be able to filibuster Court of Appeals judges but you could filibuster Supreme Court nominations. But as soon as Trump took office, they immediately eliminated the filibuster so they could confirm Justice Gorsuch 
right away. And that's one reason why I think the court should be willing, the Democrats should be willing to eliminate the filibuster on things like reproductive rights, where the court has eliminated the constitutional right, you create a federal statutory right. Uh, and that if the shoe's on the other foot and the Republicans sweep the midterm elections, I'm sure they'll eliminate the filibuster too. Of course, that will be less dangerous because President Biden will still have two more years of office so he can veto uh, any legislation they adopt. But it, it really is a sad commentary on our political process. Okay, I'm sneaking one more question under the wire. Um, and that's just something I've been really curious about. We've sort of, um, in the moment when the Dobbs decision was leaked, um, that was unprecedented and really caused an uproar. And now we've all sort of moved on. Um, but I wondered about the significance of the Supreme Court tipping its hand, or at least the majority tipping its hand with an unfinished draft where clearly, I, th I think citations needed to be filled in, it, you know, it would indicate that research remained to be done. And um, did you, what did you think was gonna happen there? Did you think that that was gonna create any procedural challenges? Um, no, I think, well, I think, I actually think the best guess as to who leaked it is that it was a conservative uh, justice or law clerk who wanted to create public pressure so that Roberts couldn't persuade Kavanaugh to flip. There's actually a, a, a news story out today about Roberts' efforts to persuade Kavanaugh and how they went nowhere. And it, it basically concludes once that draft was leaked uh, there was no way he could go back or he would be an anthema to the conservative movement. Uh, and of course, you have Susan Collins saying he promised me that he would consider Roe v. Wade a respected precedent. And uh, he basically betrayed me during the confirmation process on that. Of course, he would not have, if he had been more candid about Roe v. Wade, there's no way he would have gotten confirmed. It's interesting that the actual Dobbs opinion is almost identical to the draft that Alito leaked, even some of the controversial uh, citations of Lord Hale, the claim that abortion is a plot to kill African-Americans. Those footnotes are still in there. Um, and so I, I think all the leak did was it cemented that, um, um, you know, no position was going to change subsequent to it being leaked. So Roberts wanted Kavanaugh to flip, and then ultimately Roberts joined the majority anyway. Well, well no, he, but he joined the majority only to say a 15-week abortion ban is okay. Uh, he explicitly said, we should not be overruling Roe v. Wade. He says, uh, it's not necessary to decide. In fact, he actually accuses the state of Mississippi of deliberately misleading the Supreme Court because when they wanted them to take the Dobbs case, they said, we're not asking for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. But once they took the case, they changed their whole argument and said, we do want Roe v. Wade to be overturned. And Roberts famously says, you shouldn't decide anything more than is necessary to decide. And yet in West Virginia versus EPA, Roberts goes with the majority there where it was clearly not necessary to decide the legality of a, a regulation that wasn't in effect and had no prospect of going into effect. Yeah. I had the opportunity to have a conversation with Bill McKibben once where I asked him about, you know, the relative importance of policy and activism and, and direct action. And he said, you know, it's the zeitgeist that has to come first over policy. And I and I feel like Robert's his splitting the baby is in the in the name of the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you look at the details like you just described, it's more complicated. But at the end of the day, it's still five four. And that's what everybody's gonna remember. Yeah. Yeah. Now if Roberts really wanted to upset the apple cart, all he could all he has to do is retire. <laughs> yeah, right. That remains an opportunity. The conservatives <laughs> would break out, but uh, he's not going to. Right. 
Okay, well, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Bob. It's always a joy to have you here and talking about the Supreme Court. Um, and I know you have to teach at one, so we better let you go. Uh, for everybody who joined us today, thank you so much. And we hope you'll join us same place, same time on Thursday this week. Have a good one.